a categorized being used for tracking in and out of services, franchising, marketing with the foreign and not for profit leaders. So this, this was mostly the phenomenon of the 1990s. So this is already being stated that collaborations with state and non-profits did exist for long and in fact from the first target plan itself we have uh, non-NGOs collaborating with uh, the family planning services and the policies that were in place uh, that the government came up with. And it moves on to the RCH2 in the 1990s that get more formalized in that sense with services are contracted out or they are franchising of uh, services with the social organizations at the community level. So these are mostly like community-based NGOs with small outreach. So these are happening in pockets and uh, with little impact or just impacting within that local community. So what we have rarely studied is the non-profit hospitals or the tertiary level of care, which is the focus of my uh, presentation here. And uh, so I'm looking at their interactions, partnerships, collaborations with the state and for-profit. So there are multiple actors and multiple roles involved here, with newer institutional arrangements that have emerged in the last two decades. Um, so to broaden and pro uh, problematize the debate on PPE. I attempt to bring out the various dimensions of the non-profit tertiary hospitals and their partnerships and collaborations with the government for profit and how these reveal the com complexity of partnerships between three sectors and what means for equity. Uh, I also look at non-profit hospitals at tertiary level as public trusts. So they do come from the definition of them being charitable trusts, uh, embodying public values and hence have been seen as alternatives to state institutions at some point in time for people who are unable to access the expensive for profit care as well as the overcrowded and un run down public hospitals. I also looked at non profit hospitals and their engagements with the state and for profit and the ambiguous boundaries between the state, non profit, and the for profit. So I see that in a So uh, coming to non profits embodying public values and where we uh, get this from. So pre-welfare states, we know that charity played a major role, and the uh, role of charity did not disappear with the advent of welfare states. So even in India, we see that in the uh, absence of state welfare, charity was encouraged by the state. We, we had philanthropists, and world over, we have like religious and merchant girls. Here we had the religious. We had the Christian missionaries coming in a big way to India, and also traders and industrialists who later also uh, built institutions, whether in education or there. They were also agents of the state in a sense and received support and recognition from them. So states gave space to the, the rise of the voluntary sector and encouraged charity and social welfare provisioning and see, we see this mainly in the post-independence area and it gives rise to a mixed economy in India. So non-profits were likely to mirror public values and the reason they were also encouraged was like they were kind of uh, catering to the gap that was already created because uh, the public sector wasn't able to cater to the entire masses. So the idea was that they would be able to reach out to the poor segments of the society. And uh, the benefits were based on its intangibles, like charitable trusts were seen as institutions that were benevolent, were committed, they could be trusted, and, uh, and the community also trusts them in return. And uh, uh, it's just localized again to that area that they're catering to. So the values of non-profits definitely had an impact on the culture of the institution that it was part of. And uh, charitable hospitals embodied public values with an intrinsic commitment to serving people, especially those who are poor. But they also at the same time revived contributions, donations from the ones who could pay. So that was constantly there, that you see even in the old mission hospitals and all that uh, came up in the colonial times. So just to continue with what the general idea of a non-profit non institution is, so ca capital costs in the case of non-profits are much lower because this is where the state also subsidizes the non-profits. I mean, they help in getting them land or even sometimes give recurrent costs in bits and pieces. So scholars have also attempted to distinguish the non-profit as a third sector that lies between the state and the for-profit. And uh, primarily, uh, primarily, have they raised issues of trustworthiness, fairness, equity, um, and also, uh, so most importantly, has been the trustworthy behavior that arises from the notion of them being held in trust for the public. So the whole issue of public trust and the being there for the people. Then issues of community service, pricing, charity, 
and you have to meet donor expectations, subsidized services, commitment to place and involvement in the community. So that's quite characteristic of this not-for-profit sector. So in India, per se, they're registered as public trusts or societies. They're exempt from income tax as they're intended to provide charitable services and are supposed to utilize the surplus generated for the growth of the institution. So whatever surplus they generate needs to go back to the institution for its further growth. And it, has, it works within a legal framework of trustees. And if it's a society, then you have members. So I'm just taking the case of Delhi because this was part of my study. Um, so the, I had traced the history of non-profit hospitals in Delhi from the colonial to the present, and I was also looking at studying this transformation. What happened to these older trust hospitals, and how did the new trust hospitals emerge in its new character? So pre-independence, I had mapped the Christian missionary-run hospitals that were there. They gained legitimacy from the colonial state, but to be guided by the Christian Air Force. So we have hospitals, big hospitals like the St. Stephen's Hospital, some of us would know in Delhi, which have been around since the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, then post-independence, uh, this was also the time for Northern India when partition takes place. And we have a lot of refugee population coming from Pakistan and settling in Delhi and north of India, so a lot of traders that came at that point in time actually set up institutions in Delhi, and all of these are medical institutions, apart from educational institutions also. So, uh, so state, like, this is a quote by Nidja Mukherjee, like, the state was, I mean, even in the Nehruvian period, like, the state was an interventionist and developmental state with limited welfare orientation. So, in terms of the public services, uh, there was a limited welfare orientation, and this is where the charitable um, organizations on the philanthropists were asked to, you know, were requested or were given land and all to develop institutions that would cater to people. So in Delhi itself, like non-profit hospitals were established by the displaced population themselves and refugees and mostly traders who built hospitals around these communities that have emerged. So the types of partnerships that we see in Delhi at present, it's like you have the non-profit hospitals where the government gives free subsidized land in lieu of some percentage of free care, which was discussed. So you have 10% of outpatient uh, care and 25% of, uh, sorry, 10% of inpatient and 25% of outpatient care that's supposed to be uh, given if the land is subsidized or given uh, at a concession rate to these institutions. So according to the data that I had, 35 out of the 74 non-profit hospitals received land from the government at their time of establishment. Um, so in 1937, if we go back to pre-independence, the Delhi Improvement Trust was there and it started allotting land to educational charitable institutions at concession rates. So this is the time when you have like post-partition when a lot of uh, traders and industrialists were coming in, they wanted to build institutions for their, for the community that had come from there and they get a whole lot of land for free. And they start building institutions there, and hospitals were one of the major uh, institutions. In the, then we see, like in 1996, that's almost four decades later, the Delhi administration invites proposals to establish a multidisciplinary super specialty hospital on a no profit, no loss <coughs> basis. This is where uh, Rama had spoken about the Apollo Hospital, which was actually a corporate entity which gets free land at the rate of rupee one uh, from Delhi administration, the Delhi government and uh, builds up a big institution um, and uh, uh, it's still there till date but they of course don't uh, pay any heed to the free care and all that so I'm um, constantly being called up for that but uh, they give their reasons. Uh, in 1986 another thing happened this is also the pre like the time Rajiv Gandhi is also there and uh, pre-liberalization period and it sets the ground for the 1991 structural adjustment programs to also like completely smoothly flow in in the sense like the hospital sector is recognized as an industry and this is when the uh, there are several tax exemptions for imports on medical equipment, technology, pharmaceuticals and uh, trust hospitals are said like they will be getting income tax exemptions and all so this was a major uh, landmark in that sense. So this is the time, the late 80s, we see the creation of new trust hospitals. And these are mostly by the industrialists. 
uh, industrialist houses. So uh, we see like uh, Escort, Escorts is a uh, factor company and they have been there again since post-independence and they start with a heart institute in the south of Delhi. Similarly, Batra Hospital is also one of the, they start with multi-speciality uh, units and this is also present in the south, south of Delhi. So they kind of become the markers of new private hospitals that emerge in the city. Uh, so within the, the partnerships of like what's happening between non-profit and for-profit, so over the years like you see the non-profit itself having, I mean for-profit units within their uh, hospital in terms of new super specializations, diagnostic centers which are managed by the for-profit unit, the non-clinical services being taken by the uh, for-profit state, whether it's laundry or whether it's uh, the diet, uh, uh, food and the diet uh, department. So non-profit trusts, the, uh, another kind of partnership that was emerging also in the 90s and the early 2000s are non-profit trusts leasing, getting lands uh, from the government and uh, calling in the for-profit corporate entities like Max and Fortis. Max and Fortis have been like the major, after the photo it's been like Max and Fortis being the two corporate entities that have entered the uh, hospital industry. So you see like they have, a, so basically the land is from the government, so you have the, like the Max Devki Baby, if you see Devki Baby is actually a trust. They got the land from the government. Max takes over the land, builds the infrastructure. So it becomes Max Devki Devi, though the primary employer would be the trust. Mm -hmm. But then Max is the one who is actually mm -hmm. so like managing everything and completely like a corporate. Mm -hmm. Similarly, you have Max Balaji, Fortis, Escorts is taken over by Fortis. Then you have Fortis Flight Left in Rajanthal, that's again a charitable trust, which was a charitable trust and is taken over by Fortis the primary employer being the trust actually and so they are the ones uh, uh, contracting out services, they are the ones. Yeah. Can I just, is that the bank or is it a different, is that an Indian institution or is it? It's an Indian institution. Okay, it's Indian not the foreign bank. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> so, um, yeah. 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 Okay, so the transformation of old trust hospitals also we see around this time. So they are competing with these institutions and they are trying to survive. So you have like the case of St. Stephen's which I said was there from the beginning of 20th century. They also, they kind of com tried to commercialize. So a few years back uh, there was this news in the paper where a few of the doctors were asked to leave their units because they couldn't generate enough money for the unit. So you know this was St. Stephen's which is one of the most sought after charitable hospitals in Delhi. So there were a lot of turmoil that was going on between the trustees and the board and the doctors and this, it was all out in the paper and I had written a piece on this at that time. So they faced competition so they were either asked to shut down and they were either in that turmoil or back to shut down or to transform and I think they chose, a lot of them chose to transform. This is another case of the Mulchan hospital which actually was set up by a trader who came from Pakistan uh, in the 1950s. And this started as an Ayurvedic hospital and a nursing college, completely transformed in the 70s and 80s to so an allopathic institution, and then was bought over by a corporate entity. So the trustees are still there, the family, third generation is still there as a trustees, and they are the ones managing it, but uh, they have foreign investors come in and completely transforming the uh, look of the hospital uh, into a corporate function, style of function. So the government non-profit, for-profit, also the another kind of uh, thing you see like the where the boundaries get blurred is where public hospitals like Delhi government has give, has created an autonomous, autonomous society to uh, asking them to manage the government. So Delhi administ so there's this institute of liver and biliary sciences uh, which is uh, in Delhi, South Delhi. So this institute was uh, was per, uh, I mean brought out by, brought up by the Delhi government. But uh, what happens is that they create an autonomous society which is asked to manage this institute. So it changes in identity because then you have contractual services bringing you bringing in contractual services. You're bringing in uh, like fees for services, and so it completely changes in dimension in terms of what a public hospital would be. But then you have 
but then it's considered to be a Delhi government hospital, but managed by an autonomous society, which is a non-profit unit that's created to manage this. So we see that the character of the non-profit has actually changed over these last two decades in fact. And the newer non-profit may have received subsidies from the government in the form of land exemption, concessions for import of equipment and technology, and medical research also. So there are changing functions in the role authority of non-profits. And you can see the shifts in motivations are quite visible within these and within the trustees themselves and the management um, of these institutions. So as being charitable in the sense of old institutions, of course, that's not there anymore. And they have gone undergone change. So what we see, what has undergone change is actually the patient profile. So what you used to see, like a lot of people who were in underprivileged actually being uh, reaching out to these hospitals and some section of the middle class probably going there and paying for services. But now you completely see a transformation where it's mostly the middle class that you see going there, the middle and the upper middle who are uh, accessing these institutions also because they have access to insurance. Because otherwise it would be quite, even then it would be quite expensive to access this. But you do see sometimes like they have these OPD services which are which have separate timing, which is for the general population for the underprivileged. But then we don't know what kind of uh, identity or what they need to even you know give free services to these poor. So it's always I mean it's not like even if it's free it wouldn't be completely free. You have to pay some fee to register yourself as a patient. Then of course because of the for-profit investments and the management that's taken over. Uh, then you have other for-profit departments in these institutions. They have generally, I mean, post-independence and pre-independence, you have these institutions as just catering to one particular specialization. So a lot of them were actually maternity-focused um, hospitals or probably eye hospitals, which have now changed into multi-speciality institutions or super special uh, with super specialization. So there's a lot of change in architecture and in some cases like with Stephens and obviously the old institution there somewhere in the back and beyond but you know from it's completely different and um, so growth of irrational services of course because you have diagnostics and the pharmaceuticals there which are managed by the for profit. Then contractual labor and doctors are as guests, they are consultants there, they're not regular employers, so they are coming and going out of these institutions. And, and there's pressure for them to generate revenue for the institution. So, of course, the changing culture of these hospitals we see over a period of time. So, this is just to uh, end. Like, who is accountable? That's the question. Like, we don't know about accountability here. In a single institution, we see multiple prayers across the three sectors, and collaborations and partnerships at various levels that fragments the system and delivery of services. So I'm looking here at the government, non-profit and for-profit, there is a blurring, it's a continuum in a sense and it's fragmented, it's ambiguous, so we don't know where one leads to the other and there is a fragmentation of role, authority and power. Opposing values, which Rama had also spoken of, there is opposing values here, so the non-profit increasingly at, this, at the tertiary level is increasingly mirroring the for-profit in a sense. And, uh, uh, at the tertiary level, costs are much higher and none of the partnerships have shown any reduction in cost, especially for the patients accessing uh, them. So, uh, there are also like multiple power centers within these institutions. You have a management running which would include clinicians as well as non-clinicians. You have a board of trustees or society members. So, you, you don't know how these uh, different power centers are actually uh, interacting with each other. So this is my last slide, challenges for equity. In the present context, we know the non-profit hospitals at tertiary level are commercialized, not concerned about the, about treating the poor, uh, rational for existence of, then we question the rational for existence of non-profit in quotes hospitals at the tertiary level. So considerable work needs to be done for accountability, creating regulatory mechanisms which are actually missing, which come up once in a while but completely missing for such collaborations and partnerships. So do these institutions finally deserve the subsidies that they're getting and tax exemptions for their work? So I'll just end here. Thank you. Thank you.